Now, how else would you prove this? Uh, one of the tricky things about a proof like this is it relies on your knowledge of plane geometry. Is there another way to do it? Well, there is. I'm going to show you a second proof. It's considerably longer, and I wouldn't recommend it as like I showed you this proof here because I think it's preferable and it's a lot more elegant. Uh, but what's great about the proof that I'm about to show you is it doesn't rely on as much uh, knowledge of properties. Um, it does end up being a bit of algebraic soup, but uh, kind of the power of algebra, uh, and this was um, Rene Descartes' key insight when he uh, sort of devised the Cartesian plane, that's why we named it after him, is that you can state all of the geometric relationships that you can see here um, in terms of coordinates that you can then manipulate algebraically. So he kind of created this bridge from algebra, which seemed to just be about, you know, interacting numbers, and geometry and shapes, which seemed to be a lot more free form, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to call this proof two, coordinate geometry. Now one of the other attractive things about this uh, method despite the fact that it will be longer and I think harder, um, is that you don't even need to start with a circle, right? All you need to know is there is some um, right angle here. Oh, I didn't mean to highlight that. There's some right angle here. And what that will create is um, a, a, a diameter that P sort of can move around that, the circle of that diameter on a, a, a locus or locus, depending on how you like to pronounce it. So what I'm going to do is create that construction, right? All I know is there's some uh, right angle, APB, and I want to prove that AB is the diameter, right? So let's create this um, to start with. So if I have a triangle, let's do something like this. Ta -da. Let's make it a little more right angled looking. I, think I can do better than that. There you go. All right, let's shift this over so I've got a little more space. That'll do. All right, so um, if I again have some point P and it can move about, but what I know about it is that there's a right angle there. Okay, and then I've got some arbitrary A and some arbitrary B. So um, they are locked in some constant position. So they do actually have coordinates, but I don't know what they are. So I'm just going to call them x1, y1, and x2, y2. And the fact that I don't know where they are is another way of saying that this is generally true. They can be anywhere. So I know it's a bit funny because it's all pronumerals, but I want you to think about x1 and y1 as constants, x2 and y2 as constants, but x, y can change. Remember when I first did this, I drew, I drew this and I said, hey look, you can actually move, uh, let's do it this way, you can actually move P to some other position, so long as you fix A and B in place, um, P can be anywhere and it will still be 90 degrees. So that's why I have um, described x comma y, this point over here, those are actual variables, okay? So these are generalized positions somewhere and these things, uh, they, they can actually change throughout this situation. So what am I looking for here? Well, I'm suggesting that AB is a diameter. So somewhere on this diameter, there is the center of the circle um, and the center of the, the circle will be the, the midpoint of the diameter, right? So if I call that M, the reason why this is helpful is I know where that, that midpoint is going to be. I can calculate it using just a fairly standard coordinate geometry formula, right? This is going to be, I'll take the average of the x coordinates, so that's x1 plus x2 divided by 2, and then I'll take the average of the y coordinates, y1 plus y2 on 2. There you go. Now the reason why this is helpful is I can then say, hey, if there's some, you know, mystical circle, right, something uh, like this, wow, that's horrendously drawn, but you get the idea, okay? Um, if I've got some circle like so, oh, it's not bad actually, um, it's an imaginary circle, I don't know where it actually is, right? But I can say there should be an equation that governs x, y that makes it move along this circle, right? I know what the center of the circle is, here are its coordinates, and I also know the radius of the circle, or I can calculate it, it's going to be this length here, this is the radius here from the midpoint to either a or B, um, the, that radius, I'll just get rid of this circle here now because it's just imaginary at the moment. This radius here is just going to be half that length AB and I can just use the distance formula for that, right? So I can state all of that in a required to prove, um, you know, summary, right? I can say what I'm required to prove is that 
x and y, and by the way, I'm saying this x and this y over here, they move along uh, through coordinate uh, space such that they're on the cent they're on the circumference of this circle, right? Now, I just, I've got the, the center, I've got the radius. What's the equation of that circle? And the answer is, it's gonna be x take away uh, that the, the x-coordinates of the center, which I've just sort of stated right here. So that's gonna be x1 plus x2 on two all squared. I repeat the same thing for y, so it's y take away the y-coordinate of the center, y1 plus y2 on two all squared. And what that's equal to is the radius squared. So I said that the radius would be half of ab all squared. This is my destination. Now, just before we go any further and start to set about proving this, right? What I love about just making this statement right here is at least personally, this kind of solves, that was a bad rectangle, I guess. Let's just make a small one. There we go. It kind of solves a mystery that I had all the way through going through school and being asked to prove stuff in maths class, right? Um, you know, you'd get an, an exam question. It would say, prove this, and then it would assign three marks to it, right? And I always thought to myself, why am I jumping through these soups to prove a thing that like you wouldn't ask me to prove it unless you already knew that it was true, right? Like, wouldn't it be? I mean, but I, I really hope um, that thing has never happened to you. It's happened to people um, throughout, throughout the world where you get asked to prove something that's false and you put all the work and time in and you're like, what do you mean? I couldn't prove this, it's, it's not true, right? Um, of course, if they set this exercise or this question or this exam task for you, they know that it's true already. So why are they putting you through the motions to prove that it's true if they already know? And I think at least part of the answer, part of the answer is that actually this is the way that mathematics is created we have a bunch of things that we don't really know to be true. Can you imagine if we, we rewound the clock, uh, went back in time, and we knew, you know, we'd proved, oh, okay, yeah, that um, the, uh, if you've got the diameter, you know that that, tri uh, that angle in the semicircle on the circumference has to be 90 degrees, but how do we prove that, you know, doing it in reverse? And if we proved it this way, you know, someone wanted to double check, this is the way we know how answers are true. You can arrive at them from multiple different perspectives. How would we actually tr um, prove that this hunch that we've got actually is valid? Well, you would say, I think that this is the case. I think that there should be a circle with this particular center and this particular radius along which X comma Y can move, but I don't actually know. And so this is just a hunch and I'm gonna try and use deductive logic from what I know and, and sort of reason, reason, reason to hopefully arrive at this point at the end. All right, so that's enough preamble. Let's get to the proof. What do I actually know here? Precious little, I just know about this right angle, okay? Now, the right angle in coordinate geometry terms means that if you have a, a look at this interval here, or the line that goes through it, and if you compare it to this interval over here, what you know is that these two lines are perpendicular, which has uh, produces a relationship between their gradients, namely that they are negative reciprocals of each other, or that if you multiply them together, you get negative one. So let me just sort of write out some of that logic, right? I can say um, since AP is perpendicular to BP, what I can say is the gradient of AP times the gradient of BP is equal to negative one. Well, what are the gradient of AP and BP? Um, I just have to use the gradient formula from this point to A and then from this point to B. So hopefully if you remember your gradient formula, you can say that uh, you've got uh, rise over run. So it should be, um, y minus y1 over x minus x1 multiplied by uh, y minus y2 on x minus x2. That's all equal to negative one. So you can see here is the rise over run for AP, here's the rise over run for BP. Okay, now uh, have a think, right? Where I'm headed towards is going to be this thing here, which is kind of this quadratic in X and this quadratic in Y. And when you have a look at this, at least you know um, from this statement, I'm heading in the right direction. Um, not only did I start from something I know to be true, but just have a look. You can see there's 
y's there and then there's x's here um, so I've got the the y squared and I'm, I'm going to have the x squared if I can actually wade through all of this algebra right so let's have a go at trying to begin that process uh, you can see here I've got y minus y1 and y minus y2 up on the numerator and I can make this a bit easier for me to deal with if I take this x minus x1 and the x minus x2 multiply it across the other side so I don't have as many fractions. I mean <laughs> we're not going to escape the fractions but these fractions at least are constant whereas these fractions here I've got you know um, actual variables flying around there. So I've got a minus sign here and then I've got the x minus x1 x minus x2. So again, just to make things a bit easier for me to deal with, I'm going to add uh, that term you see on the right hand side to both sides so that I've got zero on the on the right. So I've got x minus x1, uh, x minus x2, I've just added that to both sides, that's why it's positive now, plus everything that was there before, which is this, and this is equal to zero. 